Okay, everyone, welcome back. And this is going to be our final lecture on this uh, topic. And so far, if you want a quick review, what we've talked about is that your genetics, your genes, have to be first transcribed to an mRNA, and then that mRNA has to be translated into a protein. And we talked about very briefly that, you know, sometimes there are copying mistakes uh, when you even just replicate your DNA or when you transcribe it to an mRNA, but we haven't talked about what are the outcomes of those mistakes. And so we'll get into that in this lecture. So ideally, you've got a normal gene, and that will lead to a normal mRNA, this intermediate step I don't have listed here, and eventually that will lead to your normal protein. However, you could also come across mutations where you get a mutated gene, where something is just not quite the same as it should be over here. And those mutations could lead to either abnormal proteins or no proteins at all. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, and let's just jump right into it. So just to review, like I just talked about, that central dogma of molecular biology going from DNA to RNA to protein. Any change to the sequence of nucleotides in DNA or RNA is called a mutation. Mutations can have one of three outcomes. It can be a silent mutation, um, where it reduces the fitness, uh, it can reduce the fitness, and of course fitness, uh, when we talk about it, it's not, you know, how strong an organism is, uh, or how uh, fit it looks, but its fitness is the ability to survive and reproduce. And it can increase fitness. So those one of three outcomes, it could be a silent mutation where fitness is not affected either way, it can reduce the fitness, or it, it can increase the fitness. So mutations can be helpful or harmful. And it's important to understand that when we talk about mutations, mutations happen completely by chance and are completely random. An organism cannot will itself to mutate. That's gonna be important for evolution when we talk about evolution later on. But these mutations and, and uh, changes to the genetic code happen completely randomly. Outside factors, however, can increase the likelihood that a mutation will occur. Things like chemicals, when you're smoking or drinking or taking other drugs, um, radiation, like UV radiation from the sun, those can increase the likelihood that mutations will occur, but it doesn't um, guarantee that those mutations will occur, and it doesn't guarantee where those mutations will occur. If it happens, it happens, and it happens randomly due to chance. So the first one I want to talk about is a substitution. Now, a substitution mutation occurs when one nucleotide gets replaced by another. So instead of A's, T's, G's, and C's, pretend your codons, or basically your genetic code, spells out the fat cat ate the rat. Now, in a substitution, you will t substitute one nucleotide and replace it for another. So one A and replace it for a G or one A and replace it with a T. Now that substitution, let's say we're going to replace C with H. So now our sentence reads, the fat hat ate the rat. So this can either be a huge problem because think about it, this sentence really doesn't make any sense. Hats don't eat anything. Um, or it could be no problem at all, and if it is, we call it a silent mutation. So this is that substitution mutation where you, you change exactly one letter and you switch it out for another. Silent mutations, um, how that works is, remember when I talked about codons, um, there could be more than one codon uh, coding for the same amino acid. Well, the, that means the genetic code is redundant, that there are more codons that can be used for multiple uh, amino acids. So the mRNA codon CUU codes for amino acid leucine, but the, amino, the, the codon CUC also codes for leucine. And so you can see there that even though there's been a mutation or you could change, potentially change, the U for the C or the C for the U, there's really not going to be any change in the overall result of the protein that you make because that amino acid will still be leucine. And so that's why the genetic code being redundant and having amino acids being coded by more than one codon is so useful. 
Redundancy, of course, this is just what I've been saying, means that each amino acid gets coded by more than one codon. So let's keep moving. The next is an insertion. An insertion mutation is when a nucleotide gets inserted to the DNA sequence where it previously was not. Now, here's our example again. The fat cat ate the rat. Here's your, ge your genetic information. Now let's do an insertion. Now we have the fat car tat et era t. Okay, and so you can see that insertions are really not a good thing. Um, the result of an insertion is called a frame shift. And the reason for that means that the frame shift is basically how you read this sentence. Suddenly you, you've shifted down one so that eight becomes tat and the e becomes eth and era and, and the t is left. That's called a frame shift and that's a result of an insertion. So you can see how an insertion takes something that makes total sense to something that makes absolutely no sense. And since codons are read three at a time, adding that nucleotide changes how they're read and you can you can already imagine that that is a huge disaster because you're not just making a slight change, you're changing the entire structure of your genetic code, the entire structure of this sentence. Okay, that's an insertion. What happens if we go the other way and we do a deletion? When a nucleotide is removed from the sequence, that mutation is of course called a deletion. So here's our example again, the fat cat ate the rat. Now we're going to delete something and we get the fat at a tet hair at. Okay, so uh, we've deleted one of these letters, um, and which one is it? Well, we no longer have the C in there. And so we've done that, and all of a sudden we are shifting this way now, okay, where we've got ATA becoming whole, uh, one codon, and TET becoming a codon, and we're, le we're left with AT at the end of RAT. Um, so th again, this is a huge, huge problem because we, we've changed, we've taken something that can be understandable and it's no longer understandable same idea you're taking something that can make a good protein make a good you know make a good protein and now suddenly we'll either make something horribly wonky or nothing at all um, so we also get uh, that frame shift again with a deletion um, so like I said that's since the codons are read three at a time if you anytime you cause a frame shift or either an insertion or deletion it can result in something like a huge disaster Okay, substitutions, insertions, and deletions. These are called gene mutations. Genes, of course, are the sequences of the genetic code that, of course, encode for proteins. Remember I told you that there are going to be portions of the genetic code that do not code for proteins. Well, the ones that do are called your genes. If any of the three mutations occur, the protein will most likely be changed as well, right? Unless it's one of those uh, point substitutions where you um, luckily get a codon that also encodes for the same uh, amino acid, that protein is most likely going to be changed. So those were our gene mutations. Now let's talk about chromosome mutations. Chromosomes, what are your chromosomes? Well, they're packages of DNA and proteins that, that the DNA is wound around the proteins and it's all packaged really tightly and neatly and they're just highly organized. In humans, in your nucleus, you have 46 chromosomes, and you get that number 46 uh, by getting an equal share from mom and dad. 23 from mom, 23 from dad. That's why in your sperm and egg cells, you've got exactly half of your genetic information, 23 uh, in the sperm cell, 23 in the egg cell. Now, every species has a very specific number. Some could have much, much more than 46, some have much less, and it really um, doesn't have too much to do with overall, um, uh, what I would call, like, you know, how advanced a species is, because uh, things like small uh, flowers and flowering plants have much, much more than 46 chromosomes, so it's nothing to do with that. But just understanding how many chromosomes we have and what chromosomes are are going to be important. Um, now, when we have chromosome mutations, what's happening is there's usually a change in the normal number of chromosomes. Okay, so let's just keep talking about that. Things like that you can have in chromosome mutations are duplications, where you get duplicated parts of a chromosome where instead of this is what it should normally look like, it suddenly looks much longer and has double the parts of, of it. Um, an inversion, where you instead of having the long part uh, first and the short part, you suddenly get the short part and the long part. And this is obviously changing the genetic code as well, the way in which things are read. 
You could have deletions where you suddenly have a part of the chromosome that's gone. You could have insertions where you get one, a part of one chromosome inserted into another. Um, and you could have translocations where you uh, basically get um, basically swaps where you get a little bit of this pink and the yellow and a little bit of this yellow and the pink. Now, some of this is going to be totally disastrous and other things, it, other times it won't be as disastrous. But let's... Um, Let's just keep moving because it's not going to be too important to get into this. Another example is something called non-disjunction. Now, non-disjunction occurs when you are making your sex cells. And you make your sex cells in a process called meiosis. Now, producing more body cells is a process called mitosis, where you start with a diploid cell. Now, diploid and haploid, what does that mean? Well, diploid is, I mean, ploidy is the number of chromosome, the chromosome number, ploidy, and diploid meanings have, has two copies, and haploid meanings, means to have half. And so you start with a diploid cell in mitosis, now this is meiosis, but at the end of mitosis you would make two copies of diploid cells, like all of your body cells have all 46 chromosomes. In meiosis, you get two divisions, where in normal meiosis, you start with a diploid cell. In meiosis 1, you create a haploid cell. Notice that in a diploid cell, what you start with, you get two copies of the blue and two copies of the red. Whereas in, um, in the, after meiosis 1 occurs, this is now haploid cells, where you only have one copy of each. Okay, so not, not too much to take away from this other than um, in normal meiosis, you can see that we are ready to give half the amount of genetic information so that if I was to put these two together, let's say this was a sperm and this was an egg, again, not how meiosis occurs, but this could probably be uh, thought of as making four sperm cells um, or similarly um, with only minor differences, four egg cells. Now let's say this one is a sperm and this one is an egg. If I were to put those together in fertilization, you can see how suddenly you would have two copies of blue, two copies of red, just like you would in the diploid cell, just like you would in a normal organism. Now, sometimes you get non-disjunction. And what that means is that <sighs> chromosomes should be separating, right, into these daughter cells until we get the correct amount for our sex cells. But non-disjunction simply just means that sometimes they don't separate correctly. And they, that non-disjunction could either happen uh, in the first division of meiosis or the second division of meiosis. And basically all you need to remember about non-disjunctions is that you create cells that have the wrong amount of genetic information in them. And so to, to think if you were to try to um, make a uh, baby with this sperm cell and this egg cell, it's not going to work because you're going to have, uh, you're going to have wrong amounts of genetic information that won't go together. Okay, and so that's all I want you to take away from it is that non-disjunction is what happens when your chromosomes don't separate correctly when making uh, the sex cells. Okay, so let's see. If homologous chromosomes fail to separate during meiosis 1, um, during meiosis, one of two things can occur. If the gamete has too few chromosomes, development will not occur at all. If the gamete has too many chromosomes, however, development can occur. And one of these examples is something called trisomy 21. So, for example, if you um, have a non-disjunction where you're going to then suddenly pass on two copies of, of chromosome 21, and then that joins with a normal sex cell that has one copy of chromosome 21, you then have three copies of chromosome 21. And that results in a disease that we call trisomy 21. What is trisomy 21? Well, it is Down syndrome. And these people that have Down syndrome, they live relatively normal lives, obviously not completely normal, and there, there are a host of... Um, issues that they will have to face with developmentally, um, but they can, you know, uh, live, uh, you know, somewhat full lives um, to, uh, what I'm trying to get at is, is past infancy, because other examples of non-disjunction and having extra chromosomes, uh, the, the organism will, will not live past birth or, or not be born at all. But trisomy 21 is one of the rare instances in which you can see um, a full life. Now, here's that karyotype. A karyotype is um, what would happen if I was to take all of your uh, chromosomes out of your cell and make sure that they were wrapped up nicely because your, your genetic information is not always tightly packaged into chromosomes. 
In fact, it only gets tightly packaged into chromosomes when it's uh, going through mitosis or meiosis. Uh, but if I was to take all of those chromosomes out, make sure they were tightly packaged, all your genetic information, make sure they were tightly packaged into chromosomes, and I put them, laid them out and put them next to their copy. So here's the one from mom and dad, mom and dad. Here's uh, chromosome one, two, three, all the way down to 22. And then your 23rd chromosome uh, is either the X or the Y. Um, you get two X's in females or an X and a Y in males. And here is a karyotype where we just would take a picture of those chromosomes. And as you can see, uh, this individual has three copies at 21, which is abnormal, which is the disease trisomy 21 or Down's syndrome. And so just what ha an example, an interesting example of what happens uh, if you get a non-disjunction. Here's another example. Sickle cell anemia is a mutation that can alter the red blood cell shape. This gene uh, that encodes for hemoglobin, uh, which is uh, the protein that helps your blood carry oxygen around and also carbon dioxide, and that gene gets mutated. And that um, change to the shape of the red blood cell that goes from like this uh, filled donut shape, uh, take a look at a red blood cell if you've never seen it, to suddenly being very uh, long and thin and curved, hence the name sickle cell, it makes it difficult for the red blood cell to carry oxygen. Um, and this disease is caused by a single substitution of an A to a T. And so you can see how something pretty drastic can occur just by changing one letter in a gene. Um, so here's what those normal erythrocytes are basically red blood cells look like, and here are the sickle cells. And these things um, can't carry oxygen very well and also can get stuck in capillaries. It's very painful, um, but that is, um, that is one example of what can happen from a single uh, substitution. Now, what's interesting is that there is this noticeable protective effect of sickle cell trait against malaria in uh, countries where malaria is highly prevalent. Um, in order to have sickle cell anemia, you have to inherit the gene from both your mom and your dad. If you only inherit it from one parent, you're just called a carrier. You do not present the disease. Your red blood cells would be normal, but you carry on one chromosome the gene for sickle cell anemia. Um, of course, like I just said, you are symptomless. Carriers of sickle cell anemia are actually protected from malaria and because the, um, a normal time of malaria will occurring between the first 2 to 16 months of infant's life, they get protected from it. That's where normally where you see the most amount of death from malaria. Um, so the frequencies of sickle cell carriers are high when you have uh, places like malaria endemic areas because unfortunately the um, young uh, infants <clears throat> excuse me, in the first two to 16 months that do not carry sickle cell trait, do not survive malaria. And so it's this weird instance in which you both have high instances then uh, later on of uh, people that actually get this disease, sickle cell, because if you ha have two carriers that have a child, the likelihood that they uh, create a child that has the disease is 50%, half, you know, flip a coin. And so it's this instance where both malaria and sickle cell trait balance each other out and sort of make themselves more prevalent in a weird, sick sort of way. Um, so that's it for this lecture. Hopefully you took away something good. I, I'm also posting a Bozeman science video that I'd like you to watch. It's a good podcast. Um, he always does a really good job of uh, using images to show what these things look like. So I'd like you to watch that as the last video for this module and get ready for the exam. Hope you guys enjoyed it and I will see you in the next one.